evening, everybody. We are going to get started here tonight. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Poudre School District's public forum on our long range facilities plan. Um, thank you all for being here on this rainy, cold, somewhat miserable day. And thank you all for watching at home. Um, we have a packed hour. I'm going to do my best to keep us on time and on topic. But before I go into all the logistics of this evening, I wanted to say a, a quick welcome to our superintendent of schools, Dr. Sandra Smizer. Would you like to say anything before we get started here today? Um, just thanks for coming, especially on a rainy day. Um, we hope that we will be able to answer all of your questions tonight and, and explain the process to the point where you understand what the next uh, time period involves between now and next March when we hope to finalize the plan. Um, so thanks for coming and um, we're, you're going to hear about how to get the information from tonight and how to keep track of this process as it goes forward. Great, and that's exactly what we are here to do, is to uh, share a little bit of information about the Long Range Facilities Plan. Um, also, and more importantly, get your feedback and answer your questions here tonight. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about how tonight will work. Uh, first of all, I should introduce myself. I'm Kim Newcomer. I'll be your facilitator tonight. Again, I have the very simple task of just keeping us on time and making sure that we all get home for dinner eventually, as well as trying to keep us on topic. Um, I'm actually not a PSD employee. I'm not a Pooter Schools employee. I'm a community member. so I'm I'm just here to help get your questions answered and make sure that we capture all the appropriate information as we move forward. So speaking of that, um, as you think of questions, for those in the audience, if you could write them down on the index cards that you picked up on your way in. If you did not pick one up, we will have staff walking around and handing those out. Um, for those of you watching at home, you can submit your questions at info at psdschools.org. This allows us to do a couple of things. One, make sure that we actually capture all of the questions. Um, we found that an hour goes pretty darn quickly, so we wanna make sure that we can capture those and post them online, and this is the good part. So what we do not answer tonight, and even what we do answer tonight, we'll collect all of those questions, all of those answers, and we will put them online within 48 hours of right now. Um, and you'll be able to find those at psdschools.org. If you go to that page and you look on the right-hand side, there's a link to the long range um, planning process. That quick link will take you to a community engagement page where you can see all of the Q&A from the previous forums as well as those moving forward. Whew. All right, a lot of logistics. Um, so what we're going to do now is just hear a, a brief presentation about the actual plan itself. Um, when we're done with that, I'll introduce the rest of our panel and we'll go on with the Q&A format. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Smizer. Okay, great. I, uh, I want to recognize also that we have a couple community members from our, our Long Range Facilities Advisory Group who are here tonight and who are um, coming to all of the forums to listen to the community as well on behalf of the community, and they're not staff members, uh, to also give us feedback. And then we also have uh, several school board members here. We've had school board members who have been attending all of these as well to listen to the community. So let's get started. First, I'd like to say that um, the facilities of the, of the district, the actual learning environments and the condition of all of the buildings is really important to us. We believe that it's important to our students to have a great place, a physical place to go to school. And so it's just as important to be planning for physical facilities as it is um, for the educational program. So we expect to have high quality buildings for all of our kids and, and it's a struggle as we have more and more new buildings and, and more and more aging buildings. But our goal is to try to keep good quality buildings in every neighborhood in our district. So this little video um, attempts to uh, tell you a little bit about how we feel about our buildings. Building 
So what, what we have done in the past is every seven to 10 years, we have uh, revised and updated our comprehensive facilities master plan. So the last time this was done was in 2007. We are experiencing a lot of growth in the southeast side of the district and the northeast side of the district, particularly those two areas. And so uh, in July of 2014, we got a, a group of experts together uh, to begin the process of preparing an update. So that group consists of um, staff members from PSD, including our planner, experts from the city of Fort Collins uh, and Larimer County, and private construction and architecture firms, as well as a, de a demographer that we hired who specializes in predicting the future number of students that we should expect and in which areas and in which school boundaries. Uh, so we hired Strategic Resources West, who has worked with the district in the past and is familiar with our district. At this time, the draft plan that you have in front of you is just that, it is a draft draft. It is um, our best thinking at this time based on a lot of hours spent um, with a lot of experts in the room. So we do believe it is a reasonable plan, but we have um, planned for an, an, almost a year of community engagement, including nights like tonight. So the, the actual final plan will not go to the board for approval until March of, 2014, of 2016. So next March, the board will uh, have to approve what is the final plan. So we have lots of opportunities for the community to uh, react to this plan and tell us what you think. So we have two basic needs going on right now. We have observable growth, as I mentioned, and particularly in two uh, edges of the district, and we have aging buildings in the rest of the district. If you look at Larimer County population projections, um, you can see the drastic growth that is projected to happen in the next couple decades. Now, PSD does not serve all of Larimer County, but the growth in Larimer County we're experiencing here within our district boundaries as well. If you look at our own uh, current enrollment projections for the next five years, these are the numbers uh, that came in from the demographer last fall. I will tell you that, uh, so the projection was by 2019 that we would have 30,500 students approximately, um, and that this year we were supposed to have 28,500, and you can see that we've already exceeded that projection by 500 students by October. So we are growing quickly, and uh, as you feel it very personally here at Zach, um, we can feel the crowding in a lot of our buildings. So as we look for um, solving these two problems, ongoing facilities needs of our older buildings and a need to establish new buildings for growth, it's important for you to understand that we are not talking at this time about any school closures. So at this point in time, this plan does not include any school closures. So um, the principals of all of the schools have been leading conversations with their staffs and their school accountability committees to talk about if, if they're in an older building, what are their wishes and desires for their buildings? What does each community wish they could have uh, the next time we have some money to spend on um, improvements of buildings? At the same time, our facilities department is, has a facilities audit of each building that from the strictly the facilities point of view tells what are the greatest needs for ongoing maintenance and improvement in each building. So we will crosswalk those two sets of information and come to a list for each building of what we think are the priorities for each area. Then the community facilities advisory committee will help us as we sort through uh, those priorities and they will most likely go back around to the school buildings and um, talk, help talk through with community members um, what the priorities are for the buildings. I will say that when you see uh, the number of new schools that we need to build and you add in the wishes and desires of uh, currently 50 other buildings, it is unlikely, it is for sure, that we will not be able to do everything that everyone wants. So there will be a sorting and prioritizing process that we'll have to go through simply because the cost would be exorbitant to do everything that we want. 
So we have categorized uh, the needs as immediate needs, some of which you're feeling right here in Zach, and then midterm needs. So in the immediate um, time frame, we're looking at adding modular classrooms to many buildings. Um, dealing with choice, what happens in uh, choice is that state law is that the priority for seats in a building, the number one priority, goes to the children that live within the boundary of the school. That no other option of child can um, preempt uh, seats for the kids who live in the boundary. So what's happening as areas are growing and schools are getting crowded, we're not changing our choice policy. It's simply that there are less and less seats available for students who do not live in the neighborhood boundary. Um, so we're looking at also relocating some district programs. If a building is crowded and we have a, a regional program that's housed in that building, we're looking to see if we can move it to another building. Um, and early childhood is one of those programs that we're having to move. Uh, we'll tell you more about that in a minute. And then in the midterm, we're looking at building additions and new schools and small boundary changes that would go mostly along with the creation of new schools. So this list of schools here are um, experiencing, they are experiencing uh, having less seats available for choice students who live outside the neighborhood boundary. Um, and so we're looking at managing that dynamic in each one of those buildings. It is our biggest hope, and at this time we, we are able to do it, to let students who have choiced into a building finish there. Um, we're going to do everything we can to avoid having to move a fourth or fifth grader out of an elementary school, for example, because the building has gotten crowded. Um, so we're trying to manage and let kids finish where they started, if at all possible, through this whole process over the next five to six years. We're also looking at Riffenberg Elementary. Um, they have experienced incredible growth and they had three early childhood classrooms and one by one each year we're having to move another one of those classrooms out of that building so they can use it for a kindergarten through fifth grade classroom. And then at Fossil Ridge High School we're looking at converting the dry science labs and making them wet, in other words plumbing them. Uh, because that ability to have different types of science labs in there allows us to accommodate growth in that building as well. So we're looking at everything we can do inside buildings to maximize the space that's already in there. Then in the midterm, we're looking at new construction. So we're looking at a new uh, elementary school on the southeast side of the district on the, on the other side of the highway. So we're looking down in the southeast portion of the Poudre School District to build a new elementary school. Oops, am I on the wrong slide? Uh, we're looking at building a permanent addition to Zach. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. I, also, I mentioned already early childhood relocating out of Riffenberg. Uh, we're looking at a new middle school, high school building. Uh, east of I-25 on Prospect. We own a, a school site there that is large enough to do that. If you will remember, if you were around when Fossil Ridge opened, it opened with Kennard in the building. And Kennard was there for two years, and then Kennard's middle school was built and Kennard moved out. Um, that is the same idea we're proposing for this Prospect site that the high school would fill up first and during that time as the high school is growing, we would be building a middle school, not in this part of the plan, but in the follow-on plan. The next step would be a middle school to be able to separate. Uh, the plan is not to design an instructional program that's for sixth through 12th grade and mix all those kids up. It is rather to have two separate schools that are sharing a building, just as Kennard and Fossil Ridge did. Um, we're looking at doing the same thing up near Wellington. Uh, somewhere in that area, we do believe that we will need a high school in Wellington, but we do not believe it will be as soon, based on the numbers that we have, it will not be as soon as uh, we will need a high school on the Prospect site, more towards the southeast. Um, they absolutely need a middle school almost immediately. So their scenario will be a little bit different. Their middle school will end up being bigger than their high school, and then the high school will grow over time. 
Um, also on the prospect site, we're looking at a athletic facility complex with multiple fields. We have um, incredible pressure on French Field and on all of our athletic fields. And as students grow and we have more high schools and more kids, we need more athletic fields as well. So let's talk about Zach. We're looking at putting an addition on this building to replace the six modular classrooms that you have now. And let me just clarify that when I say a modular, a modular building has two, typically has two classrooms in it. So if you use 25 as an average number of students per class, one modular building would house about 50 kids. So across the district, th those are the numbers we use as an estimate. Um, we also believe that Zach may need another modular between now and the time the addition is built. So any additional modulars that would come on to Zach would also be replaced uh, by the addition onto the building. Um, construction would begin in 2017. And um, we believe based on the numbers, and I assume there'll be a question in this area, and our, our local expert planner can talk to you more in detail about numbers. We do believe that the neighborhood boundary around Zach is almost built out. Um, if you look at the projections of growth that's about to happen, it's almost over. We believe that with an addition um, onto the building, uh, that should do it. So um, that is not the case with other schools where there's lots more growth to happen in the neighborhood boundary. We do believe that an addition would be all that Zach would need. So this is the timeline we're looking at. It's in the documents that you have. Um, construction would be planned between 2016 and 2019 to open new schools between 2018 and 2020. Now all of this hinges on the passage of a bond. We do not have money to build new schools. In the state of Colorado, this is how schools are funded, new construction is funded, is by going to local voters and asking for bonds. Um, the funding that we receive from the state just to run school districts does not contemplate new construction. It was never designed that way. Uh, other states fund school construction in different ways. Here in our state, local uh, voters have to approve new construction. Um, so we will do everything we have. We, uh, we are now modeling and figuring out how to minimize the impact on taxes. Um, and uh, Mr. Montoya can explain in a moment, um, if you're interested, how bonds work and when bonds are paid off, if you think of it as a mortgage, when your mortgage is paid off, your payments stop. We're doing the best that we can to structure this potential bond so that as one, uh, as one payment is dropping off of your tax roll, the other one would come on to minimize the increase. However, construction costs have increased phenomenally just in the last two to three years. Um, so we do anticipate that the cost for the, the um, improvements to our current buildings as well as this new construction will be large compared to what we are used to asking for, simply because the costs are skyrocketing. Um, but we are working very hard to minimize that so that the difference on a person's, any individual's tax roll would be as small as possible. Um, and we are working on financial modeling now and we'll have those numbers by the fall. We'll be able to come back out and give you the numbers that we're actually looking at. Now as we grow, all of the support services grow. We already are maxed out at our two transportation facilities with uh, places to park buses. And of course, as you have no more schools, you have more buses and more transportation uh, requirements, as well as uh, administration and uh, importantly, information technology. So all of our technology systems have to increase as the numbers of users increase as well. Um, we're looking, these, these topics here we do not have proposed solutions for yet, but they are on the table and the, the committee is still working on these issues, so we'll be bringing more information out in the fall on all of these. We have uh, a possibility of some of our alternative types of programs uh, developing some satellites 
We know that, that many of our alternative programs are very popular and they're all centralized. As the district spreads out a bit, we're looking, do we need to provide some of those alternative programs at, at alternative sites and satellites? Um, so that's one of the things we're looking at. We're particularly studying Preston and Kennard Middle School. Those two middle schools are very overcrowded um, and are very close to each other. One is a 100% choice school, the other has a boundary. It's a particularly interesting phenomenon and the committee is working to model some of the options for managing the growth in those two buildings. As I mentioned, early childhood is a struggle. We're having to move those programs out in order to use those classrooms in local elementary schools. And that is disturbing to all of us. We know that we have a growing need for early childhood um, and that parents want to have their littlest children as close to home as possible. So it's a struggle to figure out where early childhood would go. Our pr past practice has been to always have it a near in a, in a neighboring school, in a neighborhood school. Um, but because of space constraints, we may end up with sections of the district where um, we have to have a regionalized program where parents will have to transport their kids farther, which is not ideal with little, little people. Uh, and then also the, the heat mitigation efforts, our engineering study is about to finish up or getting close to finishing up, looking at heat issues in all of the buildings, uh, particularly our oldest buildings. And so that, uh, the recommendations from that study and what we decide to do with those recommendations will also become part of this plan and that work is not finished yet. So we have several groups of committee uh, community members who are helping us with this process. First, we have the long range planning group itself. Then we have uh, just formed up our community facilities advisory committee where we have asked community members to come join us in listening to community members during these forums and helping us as we look at this plan and, and listen to the community on our behalf. Uh, in the fall, we will call up the boundary committee. Uh, typically in the district, what has been done is when a boundary is being proposed to move, and you will see in the plan we have actual proposals of where we think boundaries should probably be. Um, we call up this committee of community members to examine those boundaries. So in each area where a new school is going to be built, that new school will need a boundary. So all of those students who, who are scooped up from another school to go to that, um, those boundary changes will involve kids that, are, that get to go to the new building. So that's usually a fairly popular thing is I, I'm changing schools, but my family gets to go to the new building. Um, uh, and once again, we will do our best through this process to let children finish where they have started. So most of these buildings will start with um, new neighborhoods and with new grade levels phasing in as much as possible so that kids can finish where they started. Um, and then we are proposing a small boundary change between Riffenburg and Laurel. Riffenburg is very full and Laurel has a little bit of room so there's just a very small area that the boundary committee will look at to shift from one school to the other. Um, and then we have our Mill Bond Monitoring Committee, which is a group of community members, many of whom campaigned and worked very hard for the last Mill Bond election. They get together regularly and monitor on behalf of the community what we're doing with that money. So we provide reports to them and talk with them about what was the intention in the ballot language and is the district doing what we said we would do uh, when that was passed. They uh, continue to meet for the length of the bond and for the length of the mill. So they do um, continue on the community's behalf to monitor what we're doing with the money and whether we're doing what we said we would do. So they are still uh, working. So those are my comments to get us started and we'll take questions. Wonderful. So I want to remind everyone in the audience, if you could please scratch your question down on an index card. We do have staff running around and they'll collect those and bring them forward. If you're in the front row, I could probably just scooch over and get that for you. Um, for those of you watching at home, please send an email to info at PSBschools.org. Um, while you are thinking of your questions, let me introduce the rest of the panel that we have here this evening. Um, in addition to Dr. Smizer, we have Pete Hall. And Pete is the Executive Director of Operations. Thanks for being here, Pete. I have to check out the order here. Okay, and then next we have Todd Lambert. And Todd is the Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools. 
then Dave Montoya, who's the Executive Director of Finance, and then Brendan Willits, who is the Planning Manager. So between these five people, they can answer the majority of your questions. Again, if there is anything that stumps us or that we don't get to tonight, we will be posting those online, psdschools.org. So let's start out with just some questions specific to this facility, because I think a lot of the folks here are really interested to hear more about where we are now and where we'll be going. So maybe just a little bit of grounding. Um, you know, we currently have two modulars here at Zach, um, three. Todd is giving me the three number, uh, three. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about how that has impacted choice currently and if that will impact um, choice policy moving forward for the folks here in the room particularly? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity to answer that one. I think that's on the mind of the folks who are here tonight. Uh, keep in mind in our district when a building has modular classrooms, we pay attention to two separate utilization capacity numbers. And I'll use Zach as an example to go right to that question. When Zach was originally built, it had 575 students, uh, built for 575 students. We have one classroom that's used for district purposes, meaning 550 students are what is considered our capacity. Zach currently has between 665 and 670 students as of this morning, meaning that when you apply that against 575, we're over. We're about 121% capacity. But as you know, and going to the question, we have three modular classrooms out there. As Dr. Smizer said, in those classrooms, we are in those modulars, we can accommodate two classrooms. Those three modulars allow us to accommodate 150 students if you think about 25 per classroom. So if you take that number, 665 or so against that 700, we're at about 95% utilization number. So I think it's important to know both of those numbers, and that's applicable for all of our buildings that have two or that have modular classrooms. Its impact on choice is obvious. As the neighborhood growth goes up, our principals have less room to allow choice students into the building. So if you can imagine, as we said here earlier, the first priority is the neighborhood. And so those neighborhood students have to have that opportunity to be in the building. Whatever is the difference between how much they fill up as neighborhood students and what the capacity is gives you a good indicator of just how much choice you can have in the building. Principals in Zach have had to make some tough decisions as neighborhood growth has blown up, as you well know. So each year you will see Zach's choice numbers or percentage of students in the building as choice students gradually go down. And we're having a, a pickup in that because the most choice students really are at those upper grades. As Dr. Smizer said, once students start in a building, we really don't want to move them out. Uh, we'd really rather them finish their time here, whether that uh, their parents move to another location, whatever it may be, we try to keep that experience intact for them. And so at Zach, each year, it's had, uh, you know, the principals before and with Mrs. Thomas right now have to really pay close attention to what those numbers are. And of course, the modular classrooms have been here for a while. It's never been our intent for that to be a permanent solution. And as you see from the addition or the potential for an addition, we hope to be able to take those modulars out to give that space and not have it be occupied by students outside the building. Uh, can I add too that um, on the website, if you look at the long range planning area, you will be able to find the choice policy in case you're not familiar with it. There's eight categories of types of students that are allowed in in order. And so, um, so if you're curious about the details of how that choice policy works, we're following it to the letter. Great. Speaking of modulars, um, where will the new modular be placed on this campus and what is the cost to the school itself for that modular? Okay, uh, thanks Kim and thanks for asking that question. Um, there's no cost to the school to, to bring in another unit. It's a cost that we're figuring in part of our immediate uh, uh, plan for the district expense so uh, there is no cost and at this point to, to determine where it could be located um, laying those three out like we did um, I could anticipate it maybe going to the north as we head up towards Kector a little bit we moved the fence once we could move it again um, again not ideal but uh, we've conjoined all those classrooms with sidewalks and uh, we would consider you know just blending it all together so that would be the first uh, location that would come to mind if we start moving it any farther to the south we're going to start impacting what's defined as the play area right now and and we'd like not to do that especially um, with uh, considering the population of the school so that would be probably my my first choice would be try to move it a little farther to the north um, 
when we get a little closer, we'll try to refine that, but that's first best guess on that one. When we're looking at this potential addition and permanent addition, um, are there plans to increase the size of the overcrowded, overcrowded cafeteria and gym or just classrooms? Yeah, that, and, that, and thank you for that. That question's really timely. I know Tammy Kanauer has done a lot of work with that out there. But yes, uh, we know that as the students, uh, the population grows in the building, it puts stress on other areas, uh, particularly our specialist classes of art, music, and PE. So one of the things we're looking at is as we do an addition, uh, it's not just about six classrooms. There's potential to expand space. Uh, think about additional classrooms. The issue that you have more specifically going on right now at Zach is that a few of their grades are going to a five track. Uh, if you think about the fact that you, in, that's, that means that there are five classrooms at the grade level. That puts a lot of stress on the system because we usually think of specials in art, music, PE, and then potentially library or computer, but you have five classrooms. And so our five classrooms at the grade is not a nice even one-to-one -one correspondence. It's forced uh, Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Mearswell to be creative about how they distribute kids into those extra areas. Knowing that, we just had a meeting yesterday with our architects to talk about the potential of what the building would do, not just those six classrooms, but expanding those other spaces to correspond with that growth. That's great. So um, a few more questions specifically around Zach. So I, I know a lot of the boundary conversation is still to be had, but how do we anticipate the new elementary school impacting Zach in terms of boundaries? Is, is it, um, will that, are there plans for that to change? There'll be no impact on Zach. The, the new school that opens up will really take population, uh, depending on the school, out of Bethke, Timnath, and uh, a little bit out of, a very small portion out of Bacon. So Zach will not be, Zach's student population will not be impacted by that. All right. And to back up a little bit to the construction conversation, um, for the parents in the room and, and those listening at home, what would be sort of the impact of the learning environment during construction and how do we mitigate that? That, that's a good question because uh, we'd anticipate that um, construction, uh, as Dr. Smyzer said, would start in uh, uh, the spring of 2017. And uh, at that point, uh, working with uh, the construction firm that would be selected, um, trying to minimize the impact to the school, obviously. But uh, I was asked this actually during the staff um, Qu uh, staff questioning that we had uh, a staff presentation a few weeks ago and if we would have to move the modulars into a different location to allow for the growth and once that footprint is designed trying to minimize the day-to-day -day impact there'd be a separation a safe zone communication going out to the school we designed uh, traffic patterns if we needed to work traffic patterns in a different way so it's 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 something that we have done um, we added uh, additions uh, to Rocky and Poudre High School back in the uh, mid-90s, kept school in session, had modulars in the parking lot, so uh, working it out through uh, the staff, uh, the administration to what would uh, be the least amount of impact, but, but understanding we would be building uh, during school and then through the summer and anticipating um, opening hopefully the uh, uh, the fall of uh, school 18-19. Uh, so uh, will there be an impact? Yes, uh, but we work to minimize that. Great, thank you. Um, a reminder, please, you're not limited to one index card, so feel free to scratch down your questions as they come to you. If you need more, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get those. Um, again, for those watching at home, you can send your questions to info at psdschools.org. Um, let's move on to funding. There's uh, some really great, interesting conversation around this. Um, you know, before we get into the questions, maybe you could give us a quick overview of how PSD is funded. And I know from the other forums and the confession myself, I think there's some confusion around bonds and mills. So if you could help us understand how you're funded now and really what is that bond structure look like? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> hi, Dave Montoya with Finance. Uh, so, so just a brief discussion on how schools are funded in Colorado. Um, and I'm just going to hit the big points here. The, uh, the first one is we, the, the typical funding that we receive is what we call per pupil or total program funding, and it's defined by a state formula de derived by state statutes. And those dollars are really the dollars that we use to operate our day-to-day -day operations. So when you think about the, um, the cost of teachers, paras, office support, um, and also uh, paper supplies within, when it's within a building or things like that, or any other supplies, those dollars are really targeting the day-to-day -day operations. Now, at times, 
um, school districts may find that the, the amount of resource provided through total program is not adequate to provide the programming that we want within a district. Districts have an option to go out to their voters and ask for what we call a mill levy override. And a mill levy override is simply an authorization from local voters to tax additional tax on property tax beyond what is defined in state statutes for our total program. And if successful, that would be ongoing revenue for the district, again, typically for operational type costs. Um, as Dr. Schmeiser had alluded to in her presentation, neither total program nor mill levies are any way designed to be able to support construction needs of, of schools in Colorado. And typically the way that's done in Colorado is through, through issuing of debt. And just very simple, if you think about it, what we can do is we can go out and issue debt or bonds, think about them as a mortgage, and what we, what we do is we sell them to investors, and investors say, here's, here's the cash to, to do what you need to do for your, for your work, and then over time, depending on how that bond is structured, typically 20, 30 years or so, um, over time you're going to pay that debt back with interest, so you have to pay back your principal and interest. Again, very similar to the way your mortgages work at home. Um, and that's really what we would probably be looking at for the, this construction because our operational dollars or any um, overrides that our voters have authorized um, in no way come close to uh, being able to support construction costs for, the dis for these, this plan. So looking at that bond initiative and looking at the timeline, um, the question is, are we giving ourselves enough time to go out and ask the community for a bond if we're looking at starting construction in 2016? Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the timeline laid out uh, anticipates being done by that time. So I, I don't see any issues with that. We've got, uh, as Dr. Schmeiser had mentioned, we've got a year to um, seek community, um, community input around the plan that we're, we're bringing forward, and uh, the timeline seems like it works. We would, uh, the board would finalize the long-range plan in uh, the spring of 2016. And then sometime in the summer or fall, they would um, announce or vote on the fact that we would go out for a bond, a mill bond election. So then it would be on the November ballot with the presidential election in fall of 16. Um, would we like to have more time than that? Yes. You know, if we had started five years ago. <laughs> um, but we. I think the growth is happening fast and it's obvious and we need to respond to it. So, so speaking of that growth, these are um, very clever questions. So can you explain how fees are collected uh, related to building permits for new homes and are any of those fees allocated to Poudre School District? And if so, does that help fund any of these needs that we've identified? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so earlier I was talking about the high points of our budget, and this is more in the weeds a little bit, but we do collect, or, um, uh, we do collect what we call, uh, there's two options. As land's being developed, uh, developers can either dedicate land to the school district or they can pay fees for the buildings that will be happening on those through the, through the building process. Um, so the district does collect some, um, some revenue from that. Uh, we do have about six million dollars that we've collected over multiple years and uh, those funds are legally restricted again we collect this under um, under the state statutes that allow it to happen and um, and and really what we're planning on using that for would be um, some land purchases and things that would be legally available for those funds we can't just go out and construct with those funds we we're legally not allowed to build build buildings we can do infrastructure land things like that. Is there any opportunity for further conversation with city and county entities to either alter that structure or collect more? Um, I'm probably not the best person <laughs> to ask that because I'm not no, too involved with it. But the city or county is here. The, um, I, I know from the folks that are involved in that that they are looking at that um, every couple of years and so it's always on the, on the radar as far as um, the, the fees and Pete, I don't know if you have anything to add. So the, the fees in lieu of land or payment in lieu of land agreements that we have with the local municipalities are reviewed um, and we do have that agreement. It, it can be reviewed and it is adjusted depending on the market price of 
um, you know, the vacant land that we are going to need to build, you know, also including infrastructure costs, you know, sewer and water, things like that, that whether they're part of the land purchase or not. So that can be adjusted and it is reviewed every couple of years per our agreement uh, with the local municipalities. And uh, so it, it does adjust that payment in lieu of land or the fees in lieu of land, or it adjusts the amount of land that we would request from a new subdivision. But I, I also, and thank you, I forgot that you did know all that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the piece that I'd like to add is by no means even any type of restructuring are we going to be able to restructure those dollars to be able to pay for new buildings. It just, they're, they're just too far apart. I so, should oh, I, I should mention as well that uh, on one of the back pages of the thick the full long range plan is a map of all land that the district currently owns that does not have a building on it. So you can see the little patches of empty land that we have purchased or been given or um, over the years. And so some of those, like the prospect site, are in a good location and others are not. Um, and so we'll, we'll manage our land assets as we go as well. And, and I'm going to add, because I noticed people in the audience looking through their papers as we were talking about that we're, the, there's a the, the in-depth plan where those, those plots are at, or it's on the website. That's the, also, the, yeah. the large study that's out there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, let's stay on the theme of development a little bit longer. So have we looked at what the traffic impacts would be with these new facilities and these new buildings? And would road improvements be required to... Uh, not only maybe accommodate the traffic, but also maintain safety. Yeah. You know, we're specifically looking to at the eastbound Hector at Zach's entrance. Yeah, I think at, at, at this site and at others, um, when we work, you know, for example, we work very closely with the city of Fort Collins on, on traffic. Uh, we would work the same with any of the municipalities affected with the schools, develop uh, road improvement plans that would need to come with growth, say for the, the prospect site, there'd be road improvements that would have to be enhanced to uh, accommodate that. And that's, that would be part of that initial planning phase. And as we look at this site, we're not looking at um, you know, we're looking at trying to stabilize the, the current population. So we have a traffic plan in place and uh, we're constantly reviewing our traffic plans with the local municipalities. So each affected area, absolutely, we would be looking at working with, uh, say, a developer on how traffic would best flow. And that comes with the type of land we would purchase, where we would want to, um, you know, what's the best location and what that infrastructure uh, would look like. Thank you. Um, a reminder, please uh, send your questions forward if you have them on the index cards. And for those watching at home, info at psdschools.org. Send us a quick email and we'll do our best to get to your question here within the next 20 minutes. So we've mentioned this prospect site a few times and I know there's maps in the materials. Can you just verbally give us some context as to where that is? Yes, um, it's up uh, east of I-25 and it's bordered by on the south by prospect road and on the east by county road five we have about 110 acres there and uh, currently there's uh, nothing on it it's being farmed at this time so there's a four-way stop there to get everybody oriented uh, where that is so uh, it's just off the interchange uh, to the east side and that would be initially the combined facility for a middle school high school so when we look at the area from which that facility would pull students, can you give us a, a general sense of where kids would be coming from? Yes, um, you know, right now looking at a, a boundary, um, um, something that we've looked at as more than a suggestion uh, as we move forward to the boundary committee that would make final determination. We're looking east of I-25 and uh, points north and south and then uh, some area just to the south of um, trying to get oriented here, Harmony Road, maybe a little bit east to capture some of the Bacon uh, boundary area, but mostly it's a north-south orientation east of I-25 uh, at this point. Great. And then the idea was potentially to include the athletic facility there as well. That's correct. And what would that facility look like, potentially? Potentially, and, and as we've uh, indicated in the in the documents uh, uh, a 6,000 um, student uh, person actually a uh, stadium something like French Field if you will but French Field is is um, 
you know, it's, it's a multi-use field with the track. What we're looking at is something that's, that's close to that, but and also adding multi-play uh, other fields, you know, because we're adding field hockey, lacrosse, soccer, and so we'd have to have more than that. We'd have to have the baseball fields and things like that. So when we say a complex, it's more than just a stadium, and we don't like to use that word per se because it's an athletic complex. It's, it's to take pressure off a of French field and to allow us to schedule games in a, a much more equitable manner and just to take some of the pressure off of our, our other athletic uh, uh, fields. And we're looking at um, synthetic turf for those fields. If you know anything about turf management, you know that we have to rest fields. If we just allowed kids to play and compete on our fields constantly, then pretty soon you have a dirt field. Um, and so, um, so synthetic field allows us to get much more use out of each field as well. And I should say, I think you already know this, but um, the cost of athletic fields is significant. And, um, very necessary as part of the educational program. But um, we simply don't think it's reasonable for each individual high school to have all of the fields that they need. We, we contemplate in this plan that schools will share fields and that every home game is not played on the home field for most people, just as we do now, that people would uh, share and schedule the fields as we're doing now. We would just have more than one uh, to, to use. Um, going back to that idea of trends and the changes taking place in our community, um, I wonder if you can speak to a perceived trend that uh, families with older kids are maybe moving out of the Zach boundary area, and then families with younger kids are actually moving in to, to make sure that their kids go to Zach. Do you see that happening in this area particularly, and maybe even district-wide, do you see some of that swapping? There, There is a... You know, gentrification is the, the turning over of a neighborhood, and, and that does happen, but in this southeast portion of the district right now, because of the price points of the houses and the size and, and the builds, I mean, empty nesters don't typically move into a two or 3,000 square foot two-story house, so they're going to be moving out, but with the new construction down here, uh, it is very attractive, and the price points make it very attractive to, um, you know, first and second and sometimes third time home buyers, which bring with them the elementary age students. Um, so you do have some of the neighborhoods who are going to be aging out, and their their children are going to be, you know, leaving their house. But if you look at the demographic of the southeast, specifically around Zach, these are, are younger parents. They have a lot of elementary age students, and the new construction is, is very attractive to that. If you look at the number of parks and the new subdivisions and, and items like that. So there is turnover in the district, not specifically a large amount of turnover in this region. This region is very attractive to the younger, uh, the younger family unit. Um, so we're going to skip around a little bit and talk about some of the specific schools that are addressed in the plan. So um, moving on to Kennard, if um, modulars are not intended to accommodate choice students, we um, sort of said that first priority is for those kids that are neighborhood schools, um, then why is Kennard, which is an all-choice school, scheduled to receive that modular? You know, you saw it on the original list. One of the things that we talked about was all the possible options. You're right. One of the reasons you saw that on there for modulars is there was some speculation and some of our potential options are to alleviate pressure at Preston, which as you can see, its utilization number is really high. Um, they're just growing each year. So the whole point of potentially having a modular at Kennard would be in some configuration to be able to alleviate that pressure amazing how it's all connected. Um, so let's bounce over to Bacon then. So uh, it seems like there's a lot of development, huge subdivision being built out by Bacon. Uh, why not plan to exp expand their capacity as well? Yeah, I, d I don't think that anything is off the table, but first, one of our first issues is that we manage choice. Uh, we make sure the neighborhood students have a place to go that want to go to Bacon, and then we look at the difference. And right now, that the principal at Bacon is paying close attention to those choice numbers, and as that neighborhood number goes up, those choice numbers go down. And at this point, it, it's not necessarily, we don't think that has to be an option at this point. We have speculated about it, but we're not to the point what, like we are where we're living it right here at Zach. 
right? So you can see that there's all of these uh, schools and individual needs and priorities. How, as a district, are we going to prioritize all of those needs? And where does Zach's needs, in particular, fall in that hierarchy? I'm not sure what you, what you mean by needs. Um, all the new buildings, modulars, and facilities and maybe uh, improvements and expansions. Do we tackle those in order of pri a priority order? Or is that um, based on timing? How do we decide what we do? How do we decide who gets the money and what we do first? Okay. Let, me, let me put it easier. Okay. 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 Yeah. How, do we, how do we figure that out? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that clarification. Um, <laughs> in, in the last uh, bond, the 2010 bond, that is, uh, uh, that's an infrastructure bond, meaning we weren't building any new buildings during that time. And we based a lot of the work that was done on an audit. We did a facilities condition audit back in 2007 that led to the decisions that were made in the 2010 bond, as Dr. Smizer indicated. The, 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 um, the wishes, if you will, we had needs, uh, it just it exceeded what the capacity for uh, the district to be able to fund at that time. And that hard decisions had to be made by that mill bond committee to get it down to a manageable level. So at this point now, we're doing that again. The, the, the information has been, uh, and it's supposed to be turned in by May 15th. Uh, uh, the assistant superintendents have talked with uh, the principals. Uh, the schools have gone out working with their SAC teams and, and bringing that information back uh, goes to the uh, district's facilities department, planning, design, and construction department. And they're gonna take a look at all that information and what we think is necessary. And we'll take Zach, for example, other than the addition, there may be some other things that are on that list uh, as Mrs. Thomas will work with her team on and say, okay, because you know, this building was new in 2002. It's not new anymore. So what are some of the things that, that we think need to be done could it be uh, and could be incorporated as part of the new construction would be a great time to do it once uh, the, the building is being um, added on to. Are there other improvements that could be made? And so those improvements and how they're prioritized is just in the case of this, I would say if we're going to go in 2017, start to build, this building would be a prime candidate to start doing that work in. But uh, as indicated with 50 buildings, it's going to be a, a challenging uh, decision for not only uh, the initial group, but for that community facilities advisor committee to say, okay, um, what, what needs come to the top? Um, there's code needs, there's needs, wants, there's other things. It's going to be a very difficult decision to get it down and then take back to the uh, schools uh, um, and say, okay, this is, this is what we're hearing, this is what we think we can manage, and balance that out against the, 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 the entire district. It's a, it is a challenging, um, you know, challenging process. I, th I think what Mr. Hall is talking about primarily, though, are the um, aging building questions as opposed to the new construction. You've seen the priority that we have listed for new construction, Zach's right at the front of the list. So what happens if um, we finalize the plan and the board decides to put this forth to the community for a vote and it does not pass? That's a good question. Um, by the time, certainly by the fall, by late fall at the latest, uh, we will actually have a plan that articulates what we will do if it does not pass. I think it's our responsibility to the voters to say, here's your options, um, because the growth is here and um, it's not stopping. And so if, should the community decide not to pass the bond, um, then we will have to take other measures, which would look like more modulars, um, we will put together a plan by region um, uh, that we'll, ha we'll have to put in place since kids have to go to school. So, so we have about five minutes left. I um, want to encourage you to get in your last minute questions, both to those here in the audience as well as to those watching at home. Um, just a reminder, you can send that email to info at psdschools.org. Um, we talked a little bit about the different committees that are working on this issue, and I'm wondering if you could let folks know what of those committees are still accepting members, and if they are truly interested in this process and want to participate, are there ways to do that um, through those groups and, and otherwise? The, um, the Community Facilities Committee is just now forming up. If you have a real interest in serving on that, it's not a huge committee, and I, I just need people from certain areas, but we actually I think have all that we need, but if you really, really want to send, uh, send an email in, um, I, I may very likely not be able to add you to the committee, but please send it anyway. 
The boundary committees uh, will be formed up in the fall, as I mentioned, September, October. That has representatives, it has the principal and, and a couple other representatives from each school that is affected. So obviously you will have Zach people um, on that committee. So that committee is formed up specifically around the, the areas that are in question. Great, thank you. So um, just quickly back to the athletic facility. Um, it, 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 we think, we think that it's our understanding that Loveland High School have pools on site. Is there any consider pools. pools? Any consideration for this new facility to have a pool? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> we actually considered it and um, we, I would say that there are certain parts of our community that would love it if we would build a pool. They are extremely expensive to build, but the more daunting figure is approximately a million dollars of ongoing costs annually just to run the pool. Um, and we don't have a partner to share that cost with, and so at this time we feel that these other priorities are a higher priority, so we're not including a pool in this, in this plan. Another question around the facility, athletic facility. Any consideration of purchasing or using Hughes Stadium? We actually have had several people ask that question. Um, no, we're not. Uh, first of all, I'm not even sure it's for sale. Um, it uh, actually would not serve our needs. It's way too big. We need a 6,000 seating for a football game, not 30,000. Um, and it needs millions and millions of dollars of renovation, which we would, would have to ask the voters for. And it only provides one football field. So you've heard, I think, what kind of complex we need that could be shared by high schools. And so it would be a, a huge expense and only cover a tiny portion of what we need. So. Well, I think we are just about out of time. I want to remind people that all of these questions, we are capturing them. We'll be posting both the questions and the answers online um, at psdschools.org. On the right-hand side of that main page, you will see a link to the long-range planning um, page, and everything will be easy to find from there. Um, if we didn't get to your question tonight, I'm sorry, and we will definitely answer that online as well. Um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. I know May is a crazy time of year, so I'm going to do my best to get us out of here at 6.30. Um, before we do that, any closing thoughts, Dr. Smizer? No, just thanks, everybody, for coming. And um, it's been interesting, these last several meetings that we've had. We've had, on some evenings, as many as 100 people watching online. So I know that there's a lot of interest. And all of the videos of each session are also posted, should you be I'm so interested that you want to listen to this whole presentation over again. Um, but thank you for being involved. And we are monitoring the email um, system and answering questions as they come in and posting them. So within 48 hours, all the questions that came up tonight will have answers up there. And um, we just ask you to stay involved with us as we go through this process. Wonderful. And if you did share your email address at the front of the room, we will email you when the answers are posted, so in case you forget. Not that that happens, but um, we will let you know when those are up and ready. So with that, uh, thank you all very much again for being here on a rainy, rainy day. Thank you all for watching at home. Thank you to our panel for also taking the time to be here. And uh, we appreciate your involvement. Take care.